So in the weeks leading up to this talk, I began to fantasize about how the heck I could get out of this talk. <laughs> what on earth was I thinking when I said that I wanted to do this? Was I delusional? I can't do this talk. I need to get out of this talk. Now, obviously, I'm standing here in front of you, so I didn't go through with trying to get out of this talk. But the thoughts that, it, uh, that I was thinking just really touched the surface of some of the stories that I'd started telling myself about me over the last few weeks. And they're very much connected to some old self-stories of mine. So what is a self-story? A self-story is comprised of all the things that we tell ourselves in our minds, moment by moment, about who we are, why we are or aren't good enough, what we are or aren't capable of, and what possibilities the future can hold for us. The stories we tell ourselves through our internal dialogue have a significant impact on our emotional states, as well as the lives that we allow ourselves to live. The self-stories that I'd been scripting about me are the reasons that I wanted to run far away from this event today. And I can tell you that if this were 15 years ago, I would have run away. At that time, I had such a debilitating belief that I would surely pass out or maybe just drop dead altogether if required to stand in front of a group of people and speak. So much so that in, in graduate school, I bailed at the very last minute to substitute teach a class for a mentor of mine while she was away at a conference. I had been her research assistant for three years, and our relationship re really never was the same after that. So my fears and my negative self-stories ultimately had a larger impact. But this was just one of many ways that telling myself that I wasn't good enough uh, significantly impacted my life in a negative way, especially while I was in high school, college, and early graduate school. Telling myself that I wasn't smart enough and that my opinion didn't matter meant that I rarely spoke up for what I believed in, especially in my relationships. Telling myself that my flaws and my mistakes defined me meant that I spent a lot of my time beating myself up over my weaknesses and over my choices. And telling myself that problems of the past were simply the foreshadowing of more problems to come, meant that I often feared, worried about, and desperately wanted to control the future. These self-stories that I scripted were the reason that I lived with low self-esteem, very little self-compassion, and chronic headaches, backaches, jaw pain, and ultimately panic attacks. These consequences are the reasons that I decided that I needed to re-script my negative self-story so that I could live the life that I wanted to live and not the one that my insecurities were scripting for me. And for over 15 years now, I have been re-scripting my self-stories to ones that are much more empowering. My experiences with having an internal critic uh, are the reasons that I've crafted much of my work around helping my students and my clients re-script their negative self-stories. And what I've learned in doing this work is that many of us have a really nasty internal voice. C concentrating on all that's wrong and broken within us, concentrating on all that's wrong and broken within us, can become almost automatic, and it has dire consequences. It significantly impacts our emotional state. Anxiety disorders and all of the spiraling of worry, rumination, self-loathing, and catastrophizing that often come along with them have become rampant epidemics. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental health concerns in the U.S., impacting 40 million people. 
with major depressive disorder not for, far behind, impacting 14 million people. Anxiety disorders just recently surpassed depression as the most common mental health concern on college campuses. And anxiety and depression have even been increasing over the last several decades with kids and teens. We often concentrate on what's broken within us. And we need to start thinking more about what's, what's working. The good news is that um, there's an entire field of psychology, positive psychology, launched by Martin Seligman in 1998, that's dedicated to helping research, generate, and validate strategies to help us do just this, to live happier lives, more empowering lives. Some of my slides are out of order here. <laughs> Um, so, Sanja Lubomirsky has done some extensive research, research on the factors that impact our happiness with some pretty interesting findings. So, 50% of our happiness is act actually connected with, um, connected with a genetic predisposition. Essentially, some of us are just more upbeat than others. The smallest part of our happiness, 10%, is connected with our life experiences, which might be surprising, because sometimes we think that's the largest part of what impacts our happiness. So 10% of our happiness is impacted by the amount of adversities or good fortune that we experience in our lives. And the other 40% of our happiness, almost half, is connected with the intentional activities that we practice in order to see ourselves, our lives, and our worlds is either more positive or more negative. So we actually can teach ourselves to script happier, more empowering lives. And I've utilized positive psychology in my own life to do just that, to be able to script a happier, more empowering life. But it's not surprising that we struggle to, to think more positively and to live a more empowering life. We're bombarded with messages from all around that tell us what we need to do to, uh, to measure up, to be worthwhile in school, at work, in our relationships, and really in our lives overall. Today, we have high school students that in order to get into college are juggling multiple AP classes, Re uh, volunteer work, sports, and standardized test preparation in order to consider themselves admittable enough to get, into, to get a good job after graduation. College students are juggling e-boards and internships and research and independent studies to feel competitive enough. And once we have jobs, we chase more money and more stuff to feel successful enough. And there's no shortage of advertisements for products to make us feel attractive enough. And then we have pharmaceutical commercials, which remind us of all the other things that could be potentially wrong with us, so we can diagnose ourselves with various illnesses based on a description of symptoms. Fortunately, we know how those pharmaceutical commercials end, if you've seen them. They kind of ruin it at the end, any chance you'd want to take their pill when they rattle off like 50 different things that could go wrong if you take it, like hallucinations, heart attack, aneurysm, uh, dizziness, nausea, or death. <laughs> so why should we bother trying to re-script our self-stories when we probably could be, uh, continue to be bombarded with impending stories of doom? Well, we do have, as I shared, quite, quite a bit of uh, impact on, on, uh, on our happiness. And 40% of that happiness is within our control, is within things that we can do. Positive psychology, as I mentioned, has many, many tools that allow us to do that. That's where I began rescripting my self-story, through tools of positive psychology. And I began with the practice of gratitude. 
So when I was at my absolute worst point um, in my mid-20s of having multiple panic attacks a day, I sought help through therapy, and I also sought help in you know, where I often would go, the bookstore. So when I entered Barnes & Noble that day, I didn't know what I was looking for. I just figured I'd, I'd know when I saw it. And then a title kind of jumped out at me. It was Louise Hay's Gratitude, A Way of Life. In it, people shared their stories about how beginning the practice of gratitude had completely tra transformed their lives. And I decided that it was worth a try. So I started that practice of gratitude by trying to count my blessings before I went to sleep at night, and by trying to pay more attention during the day of good things that were happening to me. This was surprisingly much more difficult than I an had anticipated. I had spent so many years of my life telling myself that I didn't, I, I didn't have enough good within me or around me, that that's pretty much what I saw when I looked at my world. I'd also spent so much time ruminating over the past or catastrophizing over the future that honestly, the present just kind of drifted right by me. It was beginning the practice of gratitude that forced me to stay in the present moment and allowed me to really see the good. And after some practice, I began to see it. Someone opened the door for me at the store. Someone, another person let me make a left turn while I was driving. I had a cool conversation with a stranger while I was in line waiting for coffee. These little blessings happened because somebody decided to be kind. And as I paid attention, I began to realize that these little blessings actually happened pretty frequently. This was the beginning of me rescripting my negative self-stories. Practicing gratitude allowed me to really genuinely appreciate my parents, my other family members, my friends, my educational and career opportunities, and even my flaws, my struggles, and my mistakes, because I finally realized that they gave me wisdom that I could use in the future and that I could share with others. Now, after practicing gratitude for many, many years, I actually find it much harder not to see all the good. And as the mom of an almost seven-year-old, I've had the last year and a half since my son Josh was five and a half years old, where I've been able to practice that nightly gratitude with him every night, in hopes that it will help him see himself as someone who is enough and who has enough. But it's not just me and Josh that gratitude practice works for. So here at the Rutgers Graduate School of Education, I created and I've taught a positive counseling class where I've had my students do two gratitude exercises. One where they keep a journal of three things that they're grateful for each day for four consecutive weeks, and another where they write a letter of gratitude to someone who's important to them, and they read it to that individual in person. Some of the things that my students have shared with me about the practice of gratitude, of, of course that it was hard at first, but that it helped them start to look for what was right in their day instead of what was wrong it overall increased their awareness of the positive in their days and in their lives. It helped them look for the good even in challenges that they were facing. It helped them feel more optimistic and more excited about the next day. And it made them say thank you to people more frequently. Leading gratitude researchers like Robert Emmons, Jeffrey Froh, and Giacomo Bono have found that those who practice gratitude, both kids and adults, experience benefits like uh, greater self-acceptance, greater self-worth, resilience, optimism, and happiness, as well as reduced anxiety, envy, resentment, regret, and depression, just to name a few benefits. I can say that it's certainly done all of the above for me. Gratitude helps us re-script our self-stories from a theme of having less than enough to one of having more than enough. All those years ago, I also started a practice, practice of trying to catch and reframe my negative thinking as it was happening. We can, our self-stories can become so ingrained and so automatic that sometimes we don't even catch the negativity in our, of our internal dialogue until we're in like full swing catastrophe mode. 
I often work with my clients to help them track their negative thoughts, and then we work together to analyze patterns, challenge logic, re-script those self-stories with more rationality and positivity, and plan actions to address only what's in their immediate control. Research has also found that challenging uh, and reframing our thoughts like this significantly reduces anxiety. In essence, it really just teaches us to speak more kindly to ourselves. Another practice that we can utilize to re-script our self-stories is by beginning to assess our strengths, uh, think about how we're already using those strengths, and plan ways to use those strengths more intentionally. We often ask ourselves the question, what's wrong with me? I always think we need to start asking ourselves instead, what's right with me? We grow up, I think many of us have been told, you know, don't brag about yourself, don't have a big ego. I think that these messages almost kind of make us get to a point where we feel uncomfortable thinking about what we're good at, that there's some fear that maybe if we were to think about our strengths, we might turn into like horrible narcissists overnight. We won't. When we know what we're good at, we can use our strengths at work and in the community to do good. Martin Seligman and other researchers have found that when we use our strengths in new and different ways every day, our happiness shoots up and levels of depression go down. The other really cool thing about knowing your strengths is that once you do, it makes it that much easier to jump into opportunities of growth that terrify us. We can use our strengths to overcome our challenges. So all those years ago, after I bailed on my mentor to substitute teach her class, I took an opportunity to co-teach an undergraduate course at Douglas College, at Douglas DRC now. And I continue to be so grateful to my, my other mentor who gave me this opportunity. You never could have told me many years ago that I would fall in love with teaching and that speaking would become a regular part of both my life and my work. One of the best things that we can do to re-script ourselves stories is to throw ourselves wholeheartedly into living a different one, one that constantly grows us instead of stunts us. I take a lot of inspiration from the work of Brene Brown, who suggests that we stop being ashamed of who we're not so that we can love who we really are. Once we embrace ourselves, flaws, mistakes, struggles, and all, it makes it easier for us to share our stories proudly and vulnerably, because we no longer feel we have anything to hide from anyone. I started today by saying that I had contemplated trying to get out of this event today. Perhaps not my finest moment, but it's still an important part of my story. Each of us has a unique story, but they're all filled with failures and triumphs and flaws and gifts and adversities and fortune. But every day, every moment, we have the opportunity to re-script our stories, expand the plot, and enrich the outcome. So I ask you, what story do you want to script about you and your life? Keep rescripting it with all of your desired outcomes in mind, and then share it in all its proud and embarrassing glory. Thank you.